stage one of Ocean Palms, 15 houses built on land that would normally have six. While integrated housing is not new to Australia, it hasn't been undertaken on this scale before. When it's completed in two years, Ocean Palms will have up to 82 houses at a cost of $12 million. Two thirds of stage one have been sold, along with a large share of stage two. Most buyers are married couples in their early 60s, wanting their own freehold title with no body corporate or strata costs. The houses are built on blocks of land that are about half the size of a normal block, so there's not much of a backyard. But they're easy to maintain and reasonably affordable, and the state government wants more of them. Frankly, uh, if we want to protect the coastal environment, with all these people who want to continue to live on the coastal areas, then really this is the only way to go over the next 20 to 30 years. Developer Bill Pershey of Coastal Pacific Consolidated Limited has invested a lot of money in the Caves Beach area. He's developed around 300 residential lots in the Caves Beachside Estate and Pacific Oceanside Estate. By the time Ocean Palms is completed, his company will have spent $75 million. Jody McKay, NBN News. Mark Sargent has always been one to lead by example. After a disappointing run of injuries that sidelined him for most of the year, Sargent came back in devastating form. Minutes before yesterday's game against Illawarra, coach David Waite broke the news to Sarge and the rest of the team that the big prop had a new job. I suppose a few people expected me to be ecstatic about being appointed in your position, but as you say, it's just a, it's a job to challenge in front of me rather than a, a notch on the belt to me. Well liked amongst his peers, the appointment has met with total support from the players. Well they've been uh, very supportive and I wouldn't expect anything else from, from our blokes. Like, they've always been very supportive of Mick and they were very supportive of Sammy Stewart. So um, you know, I, I don't think that stand is going to change. Sergeant won't have long until he slips into the new role. The season finished yesterday but pre-season training starts in just 10 weeks. An hour after the game and the Curry team were back in front of that familiar chant. The 4,000 strong crowd at the Workers Club then burst into chorus after chorus of We Are The Champions. The team song released when they won their last premiership in 1945 was given a good workout and there was even talk that it will be re-released. All the team had the chance to drink from the grand final cup. Curry secretary Ian McDonald couldn't finish his drink so he had a remedy for the leftovers. When it came around to his second sip, again he couldn't empty the chalice. The Bulldogs' victory appeared to be the tonic needed to unify a struggling community. It's now one o'clock in the morning and the cheering's been going non-stop and the singing hasn't stopped either. This party looks like it's going to go all night. Over at West, the night was passed very quietly. By this morning, the players were over their disappointment and enjoying the mateship. The tackle by Scott Bradley in the dying minutes that gave Curry a match-winning kick in front going over and over in their minds. The grand final was a real edge of the seat thriller, despite the odds Curry led at half time, only to have the scores continually matched and tied during the second half. 1993's grand final is already being tagged as one of the best seen locally for 50 years. A full replay will be shown on NBN at 10.45 on Wednesday night. Darren Curtis, NBN News.
Michael Clarkson has no idea how much racket he's making. And when he's out of the cellar, the noise of the club doesn't give him any headaches. The patrons' voices don't grate on his nerves. One schooner of blue, please. Michael is 95% profoundly deaf, but after nine months working at the Cardiff RSL, nobody seems to notice. Shandy and one small lemon squash. Right. We want them making a Oh, I think people are a bit you know, sceptical about it, which is what it'd be like. Um, but it didn't take him long to convince everyone. I think mean, he's fabulous. He's a courteous young man, you know. Very good. Michael, he's tops. We think he's terrific. Spot on all the time. I like making better people and life for them behind the bar. Been good, yeah. But Michael does face the same occupational hazards as any barman. Sometimes I have a life beating on you, sometimes get real customers who are intoxicated. And that's very hard for me to understand because I have to disagree. Michael is learning all facets of the club trade. Uh, 30 and 20, 20. One day I was with my deaf friend and we were all talking my hands and one guy said, um, what are they doing? And the wife says, they're talking, they see they can talk and think I'm going to call me blubber fingers now. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Ferry and Ron Merrick are the men behind the proposal to turn the old cottage into an operational headquarters for the Royal Volunteer Coastal Patrol. They say it will help make boating safer, allowing surveillance in an area which is difficult to cover. Our communications base there will fill a black spot which is a, a difficult communication between say Lake Macquarie, Port Stephens, Gosford and even further north. From, from this height we could get marvellous attenuation all the way through to all of our bases, north and south. If they get their way, then half the building would become a radio room, the rest tea rooms and a museum. It's an idea which has been very successful at the new Port Stephens base. We would like to look at uh, putting a tea room come museum uh, because of the army history of this whole establishment, which I think would be a great boon for tourists, local public and the heritage people on the whole. The idea has the backing of residents who in the past have objected to other proposals for the vacant building, including a BYO restaurant. In fact, it is the only proposal that is in keeping with the historic significance of the place. We would have no objection to it whatever and would support its establishment for this purpose. Jody McKay, NBN News. An Australian family trying to get home after World War II decided on a novel but daring way to make the journey. Now the subject of a book, The Flight of the Halifax. So my dad being an airman, he, he purchased a four-engine bomber, would you believe, from war surplus and uh, he advertised for anyone wanting to go to Australia in 1946 and of course half of England wanted to come to Australia. Ken Wickner was just nine years old when his family and about 20 other people took off in the Waltzing Matilda, a converted Halifax bomber which had flown more than 50 combat missions. Their course was plotted from a school atlas. The plane stopped off at jungle airstrips, still controlled by the military. Hydraulic lines were topped up with coconut oil. Three weeks later, the Matilda touched down in Sydney. Ken's family settled at Port Stephens and set up a holiday camp in the area, still known as Halifax Park. 
my dad, uh, when he landed the Halifax in Australia, said, well, that's it, uh, I'll never fly again. The book is also a tribute to Ken's father's pioneering feats in aircraft building and will be launched in Newcastle in October. Name the game, hill climb, motocross, dirt track, junior drag, supercross or speedway and Rochelle will be somewhere out front. The 14 year old from Cessnock took to bikes when she was just three. Not that there was much of a choice. Mum and dad ride a Harley and her brothers, the youngest just four, compete in motocross as well. You might think of motocross as a male dominated sport. No, I don't think it's a um, male dominated sport because um, I just think us girls can just do as well as the guys. I go out there to win and if I don't win, I get, a, get up there and give them a go. Do you think you're making some of the blokes nervous? I think I do because most of them I can beat but there is some hard ones. They include Danny Ham, Craig Anderson and world women's champ Tiffany Greenwood from Sydney. All the time I think about um, what I'm going to do when I'm racing Tiffany, like is she going to be a dirty rider, but I think I'll have a good chance against her, yeah. It is a hard and fast sport. Oh, and Rochelle is also a black belt in Taekwondo in her spare time to keep fit and fend off the occasional bump. If they do it to me, I do it back twice as hard. It was in these skies above Morissette Primary School last night where 20 people from a local dance school converged in the school playground and they watched five orange lights hover above them. The class was being held by Deborah Lee whose husband Peter happened to be filming the dancing. At 8.20pm a youngster who went for a walk yelled to the dance class to come outside the hall. This amateur vision shows what the group of 20 people saw for 10 minutes before the lights disappeared. There were like, there was five of them, they were like orange or red, like dots, big dots in the sky. Over in that direction up there, it looked like just five big stars, but you could tell that they weren't stars. So first off we thought maybe it might be a plane or helicopter, but it was obvious that it wasn't those, that's for sure. Deborah Lee and her husband Peter are at a loss to explain the sighting. I can, I came out of the hall and wondered what all the commotion was and here's these bright orange round lights in the sky just sort of moving around making sort of shapes around the sky that's very incredible. What we saw last night you know I'm interested to find someone explain to me what it was. A spokesman from Williamtown RAF base said many people claim to see UFOs but they were often the result of pranks. Jason Neuenhoff, NBN News. Falcons coach Tom Wisman was more than happy to let the coaches sit in on a session to pick up a few tricks of the trade. Each of these coaches controls their state's best junior basketballers and they readily admit watching the pros go around can add an extra dimension to the children's game. I'm always looking to learn uh, and it's easy to learn from uh, the top level so we'll certainly be looking to add to the New South Wales repertoire for Friday's game against Victoria. And they couldn't have picked a better day to sit in on. The Falcons were in an aggressive frame of mind, preparing themselves for the game against South East Melbourne and walloping the lowly placed Hobart side on Friday night. Simon O'Donnell's confidence level is soaring after a strong game against Gold Coast and he's making a strong charge to be included in the starting lineup. Earlier this year, Lake Macquarie Council refused an application by D.F. McCloy to build a $5 million retirement village on Green Point near Valentine. Council wants the site for parkland. However, this morning in Sydney's Land and Environment Court, Justice Stein ruled that McCloy's can build the village. 
Mayor John Kilpatrick says he wasn't surprised by this morning's Land and Environment Court decision. However, he doubts whether the retirement village, like the recently proposed poultry farm, will ever be built on the site. Both proposals are option two for McCloy's. The company would prefer to develop 900 residential blocks on half the site and give the rest to council for parkland. However, Jeff McCloy says if they can't have that, then the retirement village and egg farm will go ahead. Well, the bulldozers haven't started yet, but uh, we don't intend to put up one uh, development application which we aren't going to go through with. Mayor John Kilpatrick says council has little choice now but to reach a compromise. I think what it does is encourage the council to uh, talk to Mr McCloy and, and see if we can come up with a, a better mix of residential development on the less valuable land uh, and of course get the, the best part of the land as the foreshore park. But the Greenpoint Action Group says a compromise is not on and they want nothing less than all parkland. Does it concern you though that the Mayor has made comments that he would like now to sit down and negotiate? Well I think we'll have to talk to him first. We'd like to talk to him about that. Mayor Kilpatrick is confident that a resolution is in sight. I'm very confident there'll be a resolution before Christmas. Breakers officials and Darren Stewart's manager Brian Butler finalised details of a two-year contract today. Stewart is playing in the Malaysian League, but the 28-year-old Socceroo will be back to lead the Breakers next season. At least three other clubs were chasing Stewart, and with skills like this, it's not hard to see why. Breakers coach Jim Foley has about 15 players who have agreed to terms, including Kiwi goalkeeper Clint Gosling. The Breakers are now keen to sign two Adamstown players. The Hunters manufacturing and engineering based companies have traditionally been fierce competitors when bidding for contracts. But HunterNet is about to change the playing field through networking. Networking is a, is a, is a co new concept to all of us and basically what we've done is, is, is now for the first time ever that competitors are talking to one another. 20 small to medium sized companies have already joined up. Between them they employ around 13,000 people boasting a collective turnover of $170 million. The purpose of getting together is so we can join strength together and be able to market ourselves better, uh, our own individual company and collectively together, not only for this region but outside of our region, maybe even overseas. Officially launched in Newcastle today, HunterNet is planning to lure big business to the area. The group has already begun talks with tenderers, bidding for the Navy's $1 billion Minehunter project. Basically it's been a PR exercise to tell the tenderers about ourselves and to tell about the facilities that are available in Newcastle. Howard Smith Industries Chief Dr Ken Moss was on hand to support the idea and offer some words of advice. Uh, shoot for uh, the stars, be internationally competitive, don't accept anything less than best practice and I'm sure they'll be successful. Melinda Smith, NBN News. Gosford's Henry Kendall High in the yellow and grey tops dominated the first half, Shane Wright putting them on the board in the 14th minute. But it was a little early for the victory laps. With the game deadlocked for the rest of the half, some frustrated play resulted in four warnings. Morris Brothers took control early in the second half, Michael Galuzzo scoring the equaliser. However, it was a hat-trick by the Sydney side's Michael Balut that sealed victory. His first goal came from just outside the circle. 
He's next from 40 metres out. Parramatta maintained the pressure, Balut finding the back of the net once again. Then in the final minute, with a little help from Lady Luck, goal number five for the brothers. Just hours before they boarded the plane, the Falcons were still on the court, cramming in some practice. Hobart, a bottom of the ladder, but still pose a threat to Newcastle. They would love nothing better than to beat the Falcons and cost them a spot in the playoffs. They're going to be playing loose because they have nothing to play for, where we have a lot to lose. So uh, teams tend to get, get a little uh, uptight and a little tentative when they play, when they have something to lose. So we got to go out there and play as loose as they do. A win for the Falcons will lock them into fifth place. This week's preparation has been very physical. The players not afraid to use their bodies. The old adage, you, you play like you train, and uh, the players understand that. This group of players understand that. And uh, so we go hard at it, and, and yeah, we play tough ball games. And they can expect a bump or two against South East Melbourne on Sunday. Magic are in second place, and the Falcons will need all the defensive skills they showed against the Gold Coast to shut them down. The largest project to be recognised in the Engineering Excellence Awards is a section of the F3 freeway near Minmai. One cutting on this section is the largest by volume of any road cutting in Australia. The project won for the RTA the Public Works category. In manufacturing facilities, the computer integrated system at BHP Sydney Mini Mill was the winner, the design work being done by the Rod and Bar Division in Newcastle. Engineers Sinclair Knight and Partners took out the building category with the intricate earthquake repair work done to Newcastle St Andrews Church, while State Rail and Anderson Ray shared the products category. State Rail with a computerised rail profile measurement system and Anderson Ray for an ore loading system built for a West Australian mine. Coal loading at Newcastle's Port Waratah coal service is at its peak. Thirteen ships are expected tomorrow, another nine will arrive next week. But if the miners' strike continues, then it's predicted that stockpiles of coal will be exhausted by Saturday. The queue of ships will steadily grow. The New South Wales Coal Association says the dispute will cost the industry $170 million in lost business. The dispute between the United Mine Workers and Coal Companies began at midnight. 7,000 hunter miners joined their national counterparts for a five-day stoppage over what they have called suicidal price cutting by coal companies. They claim hundreds of millions of dollars in export earnings are being lost in a pursuit for greater market share. An urgent hearing in the Coal Industry Tribunal in Sydney was called at 10 this morning. At around 5 o'clock this afternoon, a decision was finally reached by Chairman David Duncan. He has ordered the miners to go back to work. The union had argued that the stoppage wasn't an industrial dispute, but a protest over pricing policies, but the tribunal found otherwise. A short time ago, the union issued a statement saying that while it respects the coal industry tribunal and its orders, it is unable to comply until a meeting of the union's central council is held to determine its response. That meeting will not take place until Monday, so effectively the strike will not be cut short. The miners were due to go back to work on Tuesday. Jody McKay, NBN News. Many farmers like throwing in a line for recreation. Peter Whitelaw grows fish as a sideline to a beef operation. 
Curry, TAFE is running a freshwater aquaculture program next year, teaching farmers how to breed fish. It's a two-year part-time course, learning to grow silver and golden perch, Murray cod, even crayfish. It can be for the fun of fishing, for tourism, but most interest is in production for fish markets. You need a dam, time to work, but compared to cattle on a per hectare basis, fish farming is good money. Well you're getting in fish value you're getting about seven and a half thousand dollars per year and in cattle you're getting about a thousand dollars per year. To try and quantify the interest in the field Curry TAFE is encouraging people to call them. Peter Ryan, NBN News. Newcastle Council believes $90 million will be injected into the Civic Precinct when the site is redeveloped. A building envelope for the project has been determined and three tenderers are finalising their plans. This afternoon, Newcastle's senior council and trade union officials met to give the redevelopment a shot in the arm, signing a statement of common purpose for industrial relations on the project. Lord Mayor Councillor John McNaughton says the statement sets out how both groups would like to see the issue handled. We came together in an agreement that we would sign a statement of common purpose that the council and the trades hall as owners and the union movement come together with a common purpose to see that this site is properly developed in the most expeditious way. Even though the pact has been signed, unions will still want further talks with the successful developer. Yes, there will need to be further negotiations between the uh, Trades Hall Council and the uh, principal uh, tenderer, uh, or the successful tenderer. Uh, but this statement of intent clearly sets out the ground rules that, uh, that both the Trades Hall Council and the Newcastle City Council uh, want to have good industrial relations on this site. The three parties in the race to redevelop Civic have already been advised of the council union arrangement. One group keen to learn more about the agreement is the Newcastle branch of the Master Builders Association who weren't present at this afternoon's signing. It hopes the approach now being taken to the Civic site redevelopment will see Hutter contractors given a fair shot at winning work on the project. Gary Blair, NBN News. Primary Industries Minister Crean released the package in Canberra yesterday offering new hope for Australia's struggling wool producers. The plan, based on the Garno report, will see a company set up to manage the 3.9 million bale wool stockpile, introducing a fixed schedule to sell the wool from July next year. The Minister says the report has two major aims. One for the government to more effectively get out of the industry and leave the destiny of the industry in the industry's hands and secondly to get it a much more integrated industry. Farmers, groups and the opposition have given the report the thumbs up. A fixed wool tax of 4.5% for debt management will be brought in and a wool research and development corporation set up. The Australian Wool Industry Council will be abolished. The package has also introduced trade expansion measures. Peter Ryan, NBN News. Port Waratah Coal Services is setting records for tonnages shipped from the Port of Newcastle with 42.5 million tonnes leaving the city in the past year. Company General Manager Philip Hughes says the expansion will lift output to 53 million tonnes, a move aimed at maintaining our competitiveness in a fierce marketplace. I think we can say confidently that um, the Hunter Valley has now been seen as a very competitive and reliable supplier. And these actions to expand our capacity will be seen very positively in, in, the, in the minds of overseas buyers as the industry expressing confidence in its own future. A second shiploading berth is planned for Kurragang. Conveyor belt systems will be upgraded to feed coal to both berths. Port Waratah Coal Services says today's announcement is part of a long-term plan by the company. 
The next stage of expansion will see annual throughput lifted to 60 million tonnes, with a 100 million tonne facility possible by the early part of next century. The Hunter River will benefit from Stage 1 with the removal of industrial pollution as part of the major dredging for the project. PWCS are needed to dredge the harbour and we therefore feel it was appropriate that we, we took responsibility in combination with the Environmental Protection Authority and Newcastle City Council to ensure that these residues were, were, looked, at, were looked after in the correct manner. Work begins next month for completion by September next year. Today's celebrations mark a $20 million commitment from the state government. The new look station includes a 700 space commuter car park, a bus interchange and a $7 million station facelift. Transport Minister Bruce Baird says the upgraded facility will provide commuters with a world class complex. This is the fifth uh, busiest station in the rail network. And obviously we've given it priority, we've spent more money here, the $20 million, than anywhere else on the network. That's made up of uh, the amount for the car parking station, the interchange and the station itself. Gosford is the first easy access station in the network and despite criticism of its design, Mr Baird says efforts have been made to ensure it's commuter friendly. Member for Gosford Chris Harcher is encouraging Central Coast people to take advantage of the multi-million dollar complex. It gives them security because this has got 24 hour police, it's got 24 hour TV cameras, they know they're safe and secure. It gives them uh, accident free journey because railway is the safest way to travel. It's cheap, it's far cheaper than uh, using your own car. It's a dog's life and you'd better believe it if the conditions enjoyed by many of the contestants in today's show was anything to go by. Preen to perfection, each pooch puffed with pride as their pedigrees were put on show by their human hanger-ons. For many of the contestants though, the show provided an ideal opportunity to catch up with old friends and swap tall tales and true. Outside the royal shows in the capital cities, these types of regional shows provide the next best competitive opportunity. They come from all around the, the New South Wales. We have also some competitors from Queensland, quite a few from Queensland actually, and we have the odd one or two from Victoria. The show will continue tomorrow with the highlight of the weekend, the regional finals of the New South Wales Show Dog of the Year. Despite the cool and blustery conditions, the racing fans came out in their thousands for the feature event on Newcastle's racing calendar. I'd say the crowd certainly is at least on a par with last year. And we're going through tough times, Peter, so we're very delighted with the response. Yesterday, punters outlaid more than 750,000 on course, 3 million on the TAB. Those figures are expected to have been topped today. It was a classy field for the Newcastle Cup and on board some classy jockeys, including Dittman, Olsen and Cassidy, all winners of that big cup down south. The track was rated as slow. Look for number one, Azam, with Mick Dittman on board, fight his way around the pack.
Azam adds the cup to his Sydney Cup victory in April. He's trained by the Hayes Group and owned by a sheikh from the United Arab Emirates. Mick Dittman was pleased with the stallion's effort. A few anxious moments about a furlong out when he, I came between runners and, and they came together and sort of chopped him out. So it was still a good effort for him to get up and win. The final divvies for 1, 16 and 3 on your screen. The Quinella paid $12, the trifecta 187 even. Peter Ryan, NBN News.